I had Logan Paul on my million. podcast. Would Logan do it with me? <laughs> Logan would kick your ass, I think. Mm. You're wa- riding a f- fantastic wave. How could you not make some mistakes along the way? Think- How can you be for small government and then have the government dictate all Thank these you. things in your personal life, exactly. right? You idiots. idiots. You got it completely wrong. Can't you just wake up and <laughs> exactly. stop? Exactly. I was walking down the hallway like a dotted bull with a needle sticking out of my ass. Tell me the five steps to like, to the gate to the point where someone like you would say, I want this guy in my life. I want to help this guy. Hey, Jordan Belfort here, the real Wolf of Wall Street, and welcome to another awesome episode of The Wolf's Den, the awesome podcast I started about seven months ago, and now is probably the fastest growing podcast in the world with massive increases in downloads every single week. I want to thank all of you for listening and tuning in and downloading and telling your friends about this. You are awesome, and part of that success, I think, has to do with this shift we've made in the last month where we always start every podcast with me covering a certain subject, telling a story, making you guys laugh as well, and educating you on something, and then bringing on the guest after that that extrapolates on what I already started talking about. In other words, they crystallize what the topic is. Now, for this particular podcast, I have an amazing guest, a man named Doug Allen, old friend of mine, famous director, writer in Hollywood. Uh, He's the guy who developed and wrote the show Entourage. He's incredibly talented and a really humble guy. You're going to really enjoy this interview. And also, we have a very interesting crossover in our friendship where his best friend from literally childhood was one of my best friends as well and also was the person who owned the other branch office of Stratton Oakmont before I got to Stratton. So I figured a great way to start this podcast off was to tell you the stories. And sort of the way we say, you know, how did all of this get started with Stratton? You know, they maybe heard bits and pieces of my backstory, but I figured a really great explanation of how Stratton became Stratton. What led up to that? What were the lessons that I learned? It would be a great way to frame this podcast with Doug. So let me just start off by giving you a bit of insight into my persona from the time I was pretty much born, and that is that I was a born entrepreneur, born salesman from the day I emerged my mother's womb, literally. At the age of five, I was the kid with the lemonade stand and doing little, you know, raffles and fairs. At the age of eight, I had my first paper out and was knocking on doors to expand it. In fact, I was knocking on so many doors and doing so well, I was well on the way to becoming the most successful paper boy in history. And unfortunately, my mom, she forced me to sell the route because I was so obsessed with knocking on doors, I didn't even want to do my homework anymore, right? She forced me to sell the route to someone else, and I retired at the age of nine and a half, worth $75 from the sale. And I thought I was the richest kid in town and felt great. But my retirement didn't last long because at the age of 10, another idea came to me. Back in the day, this is in New York, back in the 70s, I'll date myself, right? This is before Al Gore invented global warming and also the internet, which Al Gore claims to have invented, right? It used to snow like crazy in New York. I mean, there's massive 30-inch snowstorms here, which they are from school right now. I did not grow up wealthy. I grew up in the middle-class area, right? I lived in a six-story apartment building. And there's a series of other apartment buildings just like mine in one of those pre-planned communities that sprang up after World War II. This is Bayside, Queens, right? But just down the road, about half a mile, a mile away, was an area called the Bayside Gables where the rich people lived, right? So I figured, hey, you know, after a big snowstorm, I might as well try to go buy a snow shovel for $2 back then. And I'll, you know, walk in my snow boots and my parka jacket and knock on these people's doors and off the shovel their driveways for $20, right? Sure enough, knocking the first door, bam, 20 bucks. And I started doing that for two or three years. Every time it snowed, I made myself a couple of hundred dollars, and it was unbelievable. Then, of course, I got screwed by Al Gore after he invented global warming. Didn't snow as much, right? And I was out of business again. Not for long, because at the age of 14, get this, I'm watching TV. I see David Copperfield, and I think he made the Statue of Liberty or something disappear. And I was like, just blown away. I said, I have got to be a magician. I had to bug up my ass. I'm going to be a magician, right? So I figured, I got the solution. I placed an ad in the local penny save. It was a circular we had back then, right? And I put this little ad in saying, children's birthday parties, the amazing Belfort, magic, $25. Don't think anyone will call, right? Guess what? 
The next day, the phone starts ringing off the hook, and I don't even know how to do a magic trick, right? So I panic. I said to my parents, you know, Mom, Dad, I made a mistake, and you know, I did this, and I don't know how to do that. My dad's like, all right, calm down. He goes, let's take you to a magic shop, and we'll buy you some tricks. My dad took me into the city to a famous magic shop back then called Lewis Tannen. I bought my first tricks and became a magician. I was the, the amazing Belfort. And I did really well with these children's parties with balloon animals, the whole nine yards, right? And, and the lesson with that, just so you know, was that I was running a very powerful strategy called acting as if. You know, act as if you're a wealthy man, rich already, and you'll become rich. Act as if you have unmatched confidence and people will have confidence in you. Act as if you have the answers, the answers will come to you, right? Act as if you're a magician, you'll become a magician, right? You act as if. Now, just so you understand, it wasn't the most elegant form of that because theoretically, I should have basically learned a few tricks first and then you perfect them by going out and doing it. But the point was what I didn't do, what I had figured out intuitively, that if I want to be a magician, I got to put myself out there as a magician. I can't tell you how many people I see nowadays and I'm older and wiser and teach this stuff around the world. So many people believe that they can't go out and do something until they are an expert. But the truth is that there's no way to become an expert at something unless you actually do it. You have to practically go out and try something. So you want to just get yourself educated to a point and go out and do it. And you make your mistakes, you grow, you learn, you evolve, and bam, that's how you soar to success. But I got lucky. And when you're a kid, the consequences of, you know, making a mistake that are very, very low. And I learned my magic tricks and I became the amazing Belfort. I did that for about two or three years and I hit it big. For the first time at 16, many of you might have heard this story before, I started selling ices on Jones Beach. And what happened was it was a hot summer sunny day and I was down by the shoreline with my friends and I'm watching as all these people are bitching and moaning. They have this long walk up to the concession stand, which is about maybe a half a mile, quarter mile up the road, right? And I said, I wonder what would happen if I just got myself some, you know, ice cream or ices or, you know, whatever and load up a cooler and walked along the shore and sold them. Seemed like a good idea. Next morning, I picked up the Yellow Pages, found these old Yellow Pages back there, right? I found these mad Greek ice cream distributors in New York. I think it was um, in Woodside, Queens, right? And I go down there at like 7 a.m. And sure enough, all the ice cream trucks are lining up before they go out. And I have my white styrofoam cooler I bought for $7. And I loaded up this cooler with a barrel of cherry Italian ices, chip witches, fudgicles, Milky Way, Snickers. I put a slab of dry ice on top, the whole cooler. Fully loaded was $22, including the cost of the cooler. I go out to the beach, go down to the shoreline, start saying Italian ices, chip witches, fudgels. Guess what? In one hour, I sold out the entire cooler and made a net profit of $120. And it changed my life. The year was 1978. Minimum wage was about a buck an hour back then. I just made $120 in an hour. It was more than my parents were making far more than anyone my neighbor was making. And I started getting this reputation as a kid that was really going to be successful one day, a hustler, a smart guy. I figured stuff out, right? Well, obviously, what did I do? The next day, I went back with four coolers, and I sold all those out. And I became what I call a four-cooler guy. What is that? Well, let me give you a funny story here that Jones Beach is so massive. And those of you in New York know this. It's, you know, on a hot summer, sunny day, there's a million people there, right? So I said to my friends, hey, you know, three or four of my friends, why don't you come on, I'll show you what to do, and you go this way, you go that, and we'll never run into each other, right? So they did that. But guess what? Of those four friends who I showed how to sell ices on the beach, only one of them would work all day long and sell four coolers a day and make 500 bucks in a day. The others would sell one cooler and stop. What the hell is that about? Like, when you think about that, wait, you would stop with one to make a hundred bucks or so and you could make four or five times that? Well, guess what? It came down to a matter of personal standards. They had lower standards than I did. I had this high standard. I demanded excellence of myself. I wanted to be rich. I had this future in my mind that I wanted to just, you know, go after and I knew what I needed and that my standard was to literally be the best at whatever to make the most money. That was me. So to me, the possibility of stopping until the sun was going down and no one would buy ice cream, it was it was an impossibility. 
It would not fit in with my belief systems about who I was, my standard for success. Excellent. I want to buy myself a new car, put myself through college. But from my friend's perspective, one cooler, huh, I'll make 100 bucks. It's more than I make all week or two working somewhere else. I could spend the rest of the day talking to girls, getting a tan. What's wrong with that? The truth is there's no right answer or wrong answer. Those I'm not right and they're wrong. It's a question of, A, what is your standard? And here's the trick. Is it congruent with your vision for the future? Meaning, where do you see yourself in five years from now? And why does that matter to you? In other words, to me, I saw myself in the future. I wanted to be rich and successful and have a great life. So for me... The standard of one cooler would not be congruent. It would, it would be dissonance. I want this great life, but I'm not willing to do the work for it. That's not going to end up working out well for me. I'll, I'll have dissonance. I'll be uncomfortable. I'll have angst, right? However, there's many people when they consider their future, you know, well, you know, I want to just, you know, um, I don't need as much. I don't, um, you know, value uh, making massive sums of money as much. And they just don't look at their future the same way as I did from a money-centric, success-centric point of view. So to them, yeah, I could sell one cooler and it's all good. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. My guess is, though, is that if you're listening to my podcast, which is mostly centered on success and making money and you know, also telling stories, but all the things about living an empowered life, well, if you're listening to this, probably the chances are that you better be or you are a four cooler person, meaning that when you go out there, you got to be the best. You've got to strive for excellence, that you have a bold vision for the future. And what sometimes happens with my audiences, whether they're live on my podcast or on my trainings, right, offline or online trainings, is that sometimes people will have very high standards. They want to do the work, but they haven't taken the time to actually de identify and develop this really robust and bold and bright and, 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 you know, just a future that turns them on, this vision for the future that makes people jump out of bed and they lack that target, that vision to aim for, yet they have high standards, so they become like this achiever mentality where they work really hard, they make money, but they don't feel inspired. The idea here is that you want to have high standards, work hard, insist success out of yourself, but you also know where you want to end up. You have a purpose-driven life, a value-driven life, a vision-oriented life, and then you have this perfect resonance of your vision for the future, the standard that you demand on yourself, and those two together, bam, you are set. You're almost assured of success, provide that you also possess the real world skills to go out and achieve success. And that's really what I'm most known for is teaching people the actual skill sets for success. Anyway, just to move forward in the story here. So I did that, put myself through college, and then I had one misstep on the road to entrepreneurial success. I believe it or not, spent one day in dental school. Why? Because my mother, from the time I was literally one year old, sitting in the high chair, she'd be spoon feeding me applesauce and she would say, the only noble way to be wealthy, Jordan, you have to be a doctor, a dentist, a doctor. As the applesauce is going in, it's like freaking hypnosis, doctor, dentist, right? So when I graduated from college, I was a very good student, right? If you would have asked me, what do you want to do for a living? I would have said, I want to be rich for a living. I didn't know what I wanted. I just wanted to be wealthy. I wanted a great life, right? So I said, well, I don't know what I want to do. I can't be a doctor because that's eight more years. I'll kill myself. I want to be rich now. So dentist, four more years. My uncle was actually a dentist. and made a fortune back in the 60s and 70s. He said, well, I'll be a dentist. I'll still be Dr. Belfort. My mom will be happy. I'll be rich. The world will be perfect. And I apply to dental school. I get in. First day of dental school, the dean walks onto a stage here. I'm in a room auditorium with about 100 other students. And I'm looking around. Everyone seems pretty bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I'm like, all right, so far, so good. The dean has a white jacket on, white hair, very dental-looking, right? And he stands up and he says, yeah, I want to welcome you all to the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. You should all be very proud to be here. Dentistry is a wonderful profession, so bravo to you. Give yourself a round of applause. And everyone says, yay, clapping, right? Yay, it's great. I'm like, all right, so far, so good. And then the dean says, but let me say this. The golden age of dentistry is over. If you're here to make a lot of money, you're probably in the wrong place. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm in the wrong place? Holy shit. I stand up and I walk out. I'm like, excuse me. You should have seen the looks on these other kids. And I got out and never went back. Dropped out of dental school after a day. 
Now, I couldn't tell my mother this. I kind of hid down in Maryland. It was Baltimore for about three or four months. And finally, I ran out of my beach money. I had to get real in my life. And I went back up to New York. Had to move back in with my parents. I can assure you, there was no picnic back then. You saw the movie. I love my parents. They're great. But, you know, my dad passed away recently. So I loved him to death back then. But, you know, you don't move with your parents after you're already, you know, out of school, right? And I had answered a blind ad in the paper to sell meat and seafood door to door. And I had to break the news to my parents, like, Mom, Dad, I'm going to be a salesperson. And they're like, oh, my God, a sale. I said, it gets worse. I'm going to be a meat and fish. Oh, my God, my son, the meat and fish salesperson. What am I going to tell my friends? My mother's freaking, oh, my God, see this white hair? You give me white hair? I, and, you know, and they would have always were flipping out because to them, they hated salespeople. They did not think that people who are salespeople or marketers were living, you know, good lives. It was like all phony and, and fake and no substance. My mother would say, oh, there's no substance. It's all flash, no substance, right? Anyway, and, but they, you know, supported me and I went down my first day on the job and it was selling meat and seafood door to door. And I'll make the story quick, yes, because I want to get to my guest. But the, the short story is, is that my first day on the job, for whatever reason, you know, I have this inborn talent for sales and closing. And I go out there my first day after only one day of training where I learned basically nothing. And the record, I think it was like, you know, eight or nine boxes a day. It was one day of selling one boxes of meat. You were knocking on doors. It was selling people home freezer plans, right? And my first day on the job, I sold 30 five boxes of meat, broke the company record. It was the whole truck. I almost sold one woman the truck actually, right? And when I got back to the warehouse, they're like, well, what'd you do with all the meat? I'm like, well, I sold it. Like, well, who'd you sell it to? Your friends? I'm like, no, no, people I didn't know. They, they didn't believe it. They gave me 45 boxes. Next day, I sold those 45 boxes. The first week, I sold almost 250 boxes plus, and I shattered the company record. And after about two or three weeks of doing that, I'm like, why am I working for these bozos? I might as well just start my own business. And I figured I'll go down to the meat market myself. I'll make the double markup. I'll, I'll you know, you know, find the meat supply, a fish supply. I did that, bought a truck, and launched my own meat business called Manchester Farms and started making a lot of money used selling my own meat, right? Started doing so well. I said, let me buy a second truck. And I started training salespeople. And I realized, wait a second, I have a knack for training salespeople. I bought a third truck and a fourth truck. Before I knew it, I had 26 trucks on the road. I was making a ton of money, I thought, but actually, I was making every mistake a young entrepreneur can make. I was overexpanding. I was undercapitalized. I was growing on credit. And just like that, when the barbecue season ended, I was out of business. My cash flow dried up, went bankrupt, and that was what brought me down to Wall Street. So just like the movie, I you know walked in that first day and I took the job at this big firm, right, LF Rothschild, and I worked for six months as a cold caller, watching all these other kids making a fortune, right? And my first day after I passed the test, it's Black Monday. And I watch in shock and awe as the market collapses 508 points. And just like that, LF Rothschild, the firm of business for 100 years, goes out of business. I'm out of a job. And that's what landed me in this penny stock company, a small firm in Long Island. First day on that job, moving quickly here, because I want to just tell you the punchline of this whole story. The, so I'm, I become the top broker the first day, break the records, and I have a certain way of selling. It's before I invented the straight line system, but I'm doing really well. And I started helping these other kids who weren't really doing that well, and everyone started making more money. And finally, my time came, and I opened up my own firm. An opportunity came across. I opened up my own firm. It was small with 10 people. And these were not the sharpest tools of the shed. They were average young kids. And they'd been conditioned for almost mediocrity at this point. They were not from wealthy families. No members of the Lucky Sperm Club. No Harvard diplomas. They were the downtrodden. They were kids that were, they were told by their parents they were capable of greatness. And any greatness they naturally had in them was almost beaten or conditioned out of them since the day they were born. First by their parents, then by their school teachers, the media, their own friends. By the time they walked into my boredom, they'd been conditioned to survive, not to thrive. Now, originally, I started off selling penny stocks to average moms and pops. And I taught these kids a system that had no name. It was my own little sales training thing, and it worked really well for selling average moms and dads with little or no money, $500 of a stock. But then I stumbled upon an untapped niche in the retail stock market in the United States, and that was selling 5 to $10 stocks in the, to the richest 
1% of Americans who are business owners were making millions of dollars that were trading millions of dollars in the market each to call those people and sell them $5 stocks. And when I tested the idea myself, the results were so amazing, both with me and my junior partner, Danny, that Jonah Hill character, that I decided to reinvent the firm. In other words, the 12 kids that worked for me at the time, they were calling moms and pops, selling them penny stocks. It was a very easy sale. $500, it was like a lotto ticket, a dollar in a dream, right? Buying a lottery ticket, right? But the amount of money to be made by selling these bigger stocks to richer people, to the richest 1%, was so astounding, the two couldn't compete. I said to myself, all I gotta do is train these 12 kids how to do what I'm doing and what Danny's doing, and I will be the richest 24-year-old in the country. And the rest, as they say, will be history. Well, unfortunately, as they also say, easier said than done. As it turned out, training a bunch of barely post-adolescent nincompoops to call the richest, toughest, meanest, most sophisticated investors out there rich businessmen who are making decisions every day and to call those people and sell them on a stock, like on to invest a you know, quarter million bucks in a stock they never heard of, from a silly they never heard of, from a firm they never heard of, it was impossible. And the system broke down. Those I could do it. I was a natural born closer. Danny could do it. I had taught Danny to sell, but Danny was also a natural born closer. These kids could not do it. And after a month of trying every training tactic, already, again, had a system, wasn't a straight line system that I teach now, Everything broke down. They couldn't do it. I tried everything. I read every book, listened to tapes, went to every seminar. No matter what I tried, couldn't get them to close. And it all came down to this one special meeting I gave where if I didn't somehow come up with a solution, these guys would all quit. Now, at the time, here's the, the word intersects with Doug Allen. At the time, I, I had a firm called Stratton Oakmont, right? It was this small 10-person firm, and we were selling penny stocks to average moms and pops. No big deal, making a little bit of money, and that was that. And when I was doing that, there was another satellite, because I was a, it was a franchise I owned. It was one of the franchisee was this guy named Barry Gesser. And Barry owned another Stratton City, about 10 to 12 people too, and Barry was doing well as well. We became friends, and we did some talking back and forth, and Barry actually knew more about the market than I did back then, and Barry gave me some education in it, right? And then this one day... When I decide to change everything, so Barry's firm is like 20 miles away, his office, right? And I decide to reinvent the firm, and I'm selling, you know, trying to sell $5 stocks now to the richest 1% in the world, American business owners, right? It's not working, it's not working, it's not working. Then finally, I give this one special meeting, and I come up with an entirely new way of training salesmen that came to be known as the straight line system. And the straight line system, the reason it was called the straight lines, the magic moment I had is when I looked at my 12 guys who had not closed an account in a month now of calling rich people. I said, guys, don't you get it? This is so easy. Every sale's the same. And they're like, what? I'm like, watch. It's a straight line. And as a way of illustrating the way a sale was supposed to unfold, I drew the straight line across the board. And what happened is it opened up this way of thinking for me and it allowed me to teach these 12 kids how to close the way a world-class closer like me naturally would close. I was able to essentially transfer this strategy that I was using automatically that I'd been able to teach to Danny because he was also a natural closer, but now with the straight line system, I could teach it to anyone and instantly turn any human being, regardless of their age, race, creed, color, socioeconomic background, educational status, level of natural sales, really anybody, I could turn them into a world-class closer. And that was the breakthrough. This happened at about 11 o'clock at night. It was a nighttime training. Next morning, they came back. And for the first time, after not opening up account for a month, they began using the straight line system. And what happened next is what you saw in, now, actually two movies. First, Boiler Room did a movie, but it was really done right by Leo DiCaprio and Marty Scorsese in The Wolf of Wall Street. When you saw that moment, when I reinvented the firm and how the meteoric rise of the firm, and just like that, I had the ability to take any person 
and make them into a world-class salesperson, a world-class closer, and make them rich. Well, the funny thing is about 10 days later, Barry walks into my office and it's like, you're like, what? It was like, you're like, what happened? There's like 50 people now. Everyone's making 20, 30,000 a day. And Barry looks at me. He's like, uh, uh, here. And he hands me the keys to his office. He goes, I don't know what's going to happen. He goes, but this is not going to be normal. You're, you're about to go on a ride. I, I just, I don't deserve to be part of it. I don't want it. I just I have to, wa- I'm just going to watch and be your friend. And I wrote Barry a check for like $300,000. And Barry Rudolph became one of the most successful, largest short sellers in the world, betting that stocks would go down, right? And he ultimately passed away early. I'll tell you the story. Doug comes on, right? And I used the straight line system to take all these young kids. And then since then, of course, you know the story. Now I teach it all over the world. And what the straight line system does, it has the ability to take any person, any company, and just literally take all the people there and every individual turn them into world-class closers, expert, you know, animal salespeople, ethically, and just make people rich. That's how Stratton became Stratton. You get it? It was this intersection of an idea, selling $5 stocks to the richest 1%. But then the key was, that was just an idea. The, The magic bullet was the straight line system. It came to be known as the great equalizer because what would happen is that I could teach someone with no formal education to speak of, no natural sales ability, no great hopes or dreams that they'd ever be rich. They learned this system and just like that, they became equal with the Harvard graduates, the smartest people out there, the people who are almost those born entrepreneurs, who's always destined for wealth. It made them equal with them. And it never went back. Once these people learned the straight line system, they had this skill forever, that ability to influence and persuade. I always say it is the single most important skill, bar none. The ability to influence and persuade. Ultimately now, I turn that into a formal system, which is considered by far the most successful sales training system in the world. And perhaps at some point, maybe even in this podcast, I might give everyone a free gift. I would never charge you for it. It's not what I do in a podcast here. Maybe I give everyone that's listening a free link to learn the system for free on me, at least a taste of it. But for right now, I want to bring on an awesome guy, someone who I have tremendous respect for because of their talent, their humility, their drive, just because they're an all-around awesome human being. Okay, so we'll take a short break here for like a couple of seconds. You'll see the logo come on, the growling wolf. And when I come back, you will see me talking to, or hear me actually, talking to Mr. Doug Allen. I remember those days where you couldn't wait, even Sopranos, where you'd run home and you couldn't right. wait to see what happens. It's sad that those things are never going to happen again. It's interesting with Entourage. I used to be at restaurants and I'd hear people talking about it, you know, like on Monday morning. So those days I think are gone, but I think the upside is is that there's so many more opportunities for people who have talent to get their voices heard and to be seen because there's so many avenues available to them, you know? Hey guys, JB here, The Wolf in the Wolf's Den. This is going to be one of my favorite podcasts of all time. Someone I've wanted to get on since the day I launched this podcast. It's a friend of mine, very, very well-respected director, showrunner, creator of movies in Hollywood, one of the most well-liked people in Hollywood and most well-connected people in Hollywood, but actually just a great guy and old friend, Doug Ellen. What's up, my friend? What's up? How so, you doing? So, like, Doug's one of those people you may think, who? Okay, let me... You guys have all seen Entourage, right? He's the creator, the the brilliance behind that show that ran how many? Eight seasons, was eight it? Seasons. Eight seasons and a, movie. and a movie. I've watched every episode like 19 times. I like that. I really have. I know I everything about it. the show. You guys, some of the greatest lines, I think, okay, the one line <laughs> that, that stuck out that I, I just had to laugh at was like, she's top tall. Like, it was that sort of shit like that made Entourage yeah. Entourage, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what we did. Yeah. Who came up with all this stuff? I, I mean, I came up with a lot of it, obviously, but, uh, you know, the first the first thing I did was, uh, you know, I hired my buddy Rob Weiss when I started, so. You know, He's two, a great writer. Two, two Long Island guys, we, we have similar sensibilities, but, you know, a lot of the dialogue was, was mine there. Right. Yeah. And what was, was, it, was this about, was it based on Wahlberg, well, very loosely, just that the, was I, the idea of a Wahlberg, yeah. right? I mean, it, it, it 
came to me from his manager and we started like looking for a mark, which we realized, as you see in the movie business, is so hard to find. There's not right. a lot of marks out there. When we cast Adrian, it was different. And also at the beginning, I said, I need to make it New York. That's what I know. I, need, I know those guys, not Boston. So it was loosely based on some stories from Mark and then kind of morphed into a lot of stories from my life. So, And, and so when you... That, that was the first thing you've done in Hollywood, though, right? Was that was no, that like no. the, well, how did it stop you in Hollywood? Like, how, tell me the whole. I started journey. as a I graduated college. I came out here as a stand up comedian. I mean, you know, came out here as a stand. I started doing it. I didn't know anybody. So stand you, you, stand up comedian. I started doing stand up comedy when I got out here. Really? Um, I worked in the mailroom at New Line Cinema. Okay. And um, I wrote a short film and I directed it, and I ended up selling it to Showtime, which was the first time I was ever on a any type of movie set. After that, I got offered a very strange movie off of my short film called Fat Beach, which uh, 20 years later... P-H-A-T. P-H-A-T, which now is like a common word. At the time, it was not. When they called me up, they're like, we saw your short film, we want you to direct Fat Beach in 1991. I, I, you know, I didn't know what the word fat was, and I was like, whatever. Anyway. Right around the same time, I like, someone get, show me a, a label, Fat Farm. I'm like, what's Fat Farm? Yeah. They're like, no, P-H-A-T, yeah. Russell. Well, honestly, Fat then really went everywhere. I'm not right. saying it was the movie, but the, it's funny, because this movie that cost $100,000, which was playing all around the world, Chris Rock used to make fun of it in his stand-up act, and um, I used to get lots of meetings in this town with whoever, Ice Cube for Friday, and you know, when I got there, he's like, and to be honest with you, I was expecting you to be black when you got to the meeting, so <laughs> uh, I did not get that movie anyway, but um, you know, that, that's where it started, so. And so then how did, so like, so, and how many, what year was that? That was 90 what? It was like 91, 92. Then I did a movie called Kissing a Fool with uh, David Schwimmer and Jason Lee, which was another independent movie. Universal bought, released uh, worldwide again, which is probably too big a release for that movie. But, right. um, and then, you know, wrote, sold a bunch of scripts, and then um, Entourage happened in 2001. So it was 2001. So how did that, tell the me the story about how that started. The whole, I mean, give me the, the, the that cause. started, it's actually funny, because how kind of Hollywood goes crazy and how, wow, it's it's 18 years. But basically, I, I had sold a bunch of scripts, and some don't, lots of scripts don't get made. And um, I was with a friend of mine named Dylan Sellers, and he said, you got to get into TV. I've got all these friends in TV. They're making all this money. Half of them aren't any good. I said, well, what do I do to get into TV? He said, write a spec script for a show you like, and then we'll get it to people and whatever. I literally wrote a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode, like a spec, in two hours. And I sent it off to Steve Levinson, who's my friend from college and Mark's manager, and he read it that night and said, you know, we're thinking about this show idea. We don't really know what it is with Mark called Entourage. And we don't know what it is, but it's him and his friends. And I said, that's the worst. I, I literally said, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. I don't want to watch like a bunch <laughs> of losers follow a movie star around. And Steve said, he goes, you'll figure it out. So I sat around and I thought about it. And that's really where it started. So And you just, what, you wrote a spec script? Or, no, we or, went or, or. and we went and pitched it to HBO, which was, uh, you know, a wild experience in itself. Because, you know, you spend a lot of time coming up with the ideas and writing all this stuff. But it's where I met Ari. Because in the, in the pitch that I was ready to pitch, I had Jeremy Piven playing my agent at the time, Jeff Jacobs. Like, I wanted Jeremy from Larry Sanders' show. I thought he was great. And then when we walked into the HBO meeting, Mark wasn't there, but his agent was, Ari. And I met Ari, and Ari just takes over the room. I'm like, this guy's the character. Like, we need, you know, this. So when we walked out of that meeting, which we sold it, which, again, selling a script is one thing, getting a show on the air is another, but we sold the script in the room without me even talking. Ari said, it's Mark and his friends. This guy's going to write it. If it sucks, we're going to fire him, and someone else will rewrite it. <laughs> And when I walked out, I said, this guy's got to be like a main character in the show. So I thought about Piven playing him from that point on. So Wow. Um, and then, you know, it was two years of... of That's Ari dress. Emanuel. So it's a direct... So the Ari character is Ari Emanuel. 100%. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, I mean, and, and as Ari used to say, Ari's like, he's nothing compared to me, you know? There was one time when I was with Ari and he's like, you don't even know how to write me and we're in a place. He starts pretending to have a fight with a client on the phone. Um, he's kind of joking around. We're in the Palm before a basketball game, uh, Lakers game. I mean, the place is fucking packed. And Ari is yelling at this guy, but being funny, putting a show on it. And then the guy says something that really pisses Ari off. And the next thing I know, he's literally yelling at him. The entire <laughs> restaurant is looking at him. And I remember the line. He was like, I don't give a shit if you're six years old. Six year olds in the car. Take me off speakerphone. But um, <laughs> he was, uh, he, he's a, an amazing character, you know? And he, he sold the show, though, you know? Wow. So. so you sold the show in the room, right? And mm -hmm. then so that and then how long did it take till it actually 
20 months and 500 drafts. I mean, I kept writing different versions. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. And finally, one day they picked it up. So, Wow. Yeah. How'd you come up? So, so I think there's like, you know, it's like it happens very rarely when there's just the chemistry between all the players yeah. is just right. You sort of like on Friends. Yeah. Because like, there's an ensemble cast. Yeah. Right. And so, so how'd you choose? Like it was Kevin Connolly, right? It was so, Ke- yeah, I mean, who is a friend of mine. I love Kevin's. Yeah. He's awesome. I mean, we it was a long casting process because we weren't going to settle. Unlike like a network show like Friends, sometimes you have to get lucky because you have such a quick window and you have to cast it and go. So God bless them, it worked out for them. We took our time. We were not starting to shoot until we found everybody that we really liked. And uh, Kevin Connolly was one of the more interesting ones because I could not cast that part. And I wrote in the script. It was like a Jack Russell Terrier who was kind of like a like a Joe Pesci type, like little guy who was ready to fight anybody. And I didn't know Kevin, but I kept getting calls from friends who were like, I looked at your script. Kevin Connolly's the guy. I'm like, I don't know who he is. And they're like, called his agent, and they said he's not acting anymore. So I kept trying to find him. They're like, no. he's not acting. He's just directing, da 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 And uh, I called Mark. I said, you know, you got to call this guy. So Mark called Kevin set up a meeting for Kevin and I to have dinner. And we had dinner. And basically, Kevin's you know one of my best friends now. But right, Kevin, he's a, he's a Kevin essentially at the dinner was like, listen. He was on the podcast like last night. I, I love he's, Kevin. He's the best. But Kevin was essentially like at the dinner. I'm not. I'm only going to audition for this if you kind of guarantee that I'm going to get it, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, listen, I'm not even in charge, to be honest. Like, I'm going to tell them who I want. But they're going to pick it at the end of the day. But the second I met Kevin, which was similar with Dylan, and similar with Jerry, it was like the second I met them, I was like, these are the guys, you know. So they're like the guys I grew up with, and that's what I was looking for. So, okay, so Kevin, so that, and Ke- by he was unbelievable yeah, too. Yeah. Kevin Dylan, uh, Dylan's genius. I mean, he's like, I mean, Dylan. I was out with Dylan's uh, ex girlfriend the night before. She's like, Kevin Dylan is my ex boyfriend. He's coming in to read for you tomorrow, and I was like, huh. He said one line, and I was like, this guy's gonna win an Emmy. I know it, you know. And uh, he didn't win, but he got nominated. So. Unreal. Yeah. And what about and the last one was um, Turtles? Uh, Jerry. Yeah. Jerry. You know, which is also interesting because Jerry and Kevin Dillon are separated by, I forget, nine, 11 years. They were supposed to be playing like they were in high school together. So that was a big panic that that was not going to make any sense to people. And I tried everything to make Jerry look older, but the truth is nobody ever said a word about never it. Even it never, thought it, never, never even occurred to me. You know, like that he was, he would have been 30 and Jerry 20. So interesting. Yeah. And how about Adrian Grenier? So. Adrian was a client of Steve's and, um, you know, Steve was, Steve's pretty great and has an eye and he kind of, I was looking for Mark. I was looking for like guys that grow up with these tough guys and, you know, I couldn't find him. And Adrian was always around the office, but I, I never looked at him and, he, and Steve one day was like, that's the guy right there sitting on the computer in the corner. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and when we put him on camera, you just saw it. I mean, he looked like a movie star that you'd never seen before. So, um, and he carried himself that way and it was, you know, perfect. So. So how so you know what amazes me about that is that there's just something about entourage that it's like you it's like a feel good go to show. Do you think like with like today now like you know the world has changed with all the Me Too yeah. stuff? You think that show still would have gotten greenlit like today? Never, no, no way, right? But it's interesting, you know, even talking to you about it because and I told you this because we saw we saw the screening of uh, you took me to a screening of Wolf and it was like. <laughs> It was, I'm trying to remember the timeline, but it was only a little bit before the Entourage movie was coming out. And I was like, oh, is Entourage like, is it too crass? Is it too this, (laughs) too that? And I remember sitting in this movie going, holy shit, like we're so tame and so mild. And then, uh, you know, it's interesting with the Me Too movement because it was really happening right then. And the critics just trashed the Entourage movie. And the truth is, like, you can say whatever you want about it, but if you like the show, you like the movie. It was basically... It was the same thing. It was the same thing. But with Wolf of Wall Street, which I'm not comparing myself to Marty, (laughs) and... They loved it. But, I mean, the truth is, it's the ultimate glorification of, like, guys being animals. where, Where Entourage... I always was really highly trying my best to not make them animals, you know? And then I see Wolf of Wall Street, I'm like, oh my God. And, and now you look at it, it's like, I mean, I sit at dinner with you and, and I see how guys react to you. They're like, I just want to party with you, man. I just want to hang out, whatever. So it, it, it's an interesting way the world kind of twists and looks at it, but... Um, I guess mine was because it was historical. 
Well, because it's true, and at the end of the day, they get arrested. Nobody gets arrested Exa in that. Uh, right, exactly. Nobody gets arrested. Pay the price yeah. for it. Yeah, you're playing guy. tennis at the I'm end of the movie. I'm a different guy <laughs> today, right? So now, listen, I, I want to just, I, I want to go back to Antoine, but we yeah. can't go much further without talking about our common friend who passed away, yeah. right? So we, you know, guys, you know, I'll tell you a great story here. That um, when I started Stratton, right? And I think you know this story. So when Str I bought Stratton from someone else, and when I went into into this company. Stratton, I was like a franchise. And there was only one other franchise. And the other franchise was owned by this guy named Barry Gesser, right? I didn't know Barry. So, you know, I meet Barry. This is before, right before I invented the system, the straight line system, before I cracked the code of how to train salesmen. So Barry and I were like running parallel. We each had eight salesmen. Then one day I basically in, invent this new way of training salespeople. And Barry comes back like a week later and my firm's like exploding and making millions. And Barry's like, Holy fucking shit. And he, he like, here's the keys. He goes, here, just here. Right. And I gave him like 300 grand. We just became really great friends. Right. And Barry's a fucking wild man. Yeah. One of the smartest people mm -hmm. and one of the craziest bastards I ever met in my life. But yeah. brilliant guy, right? And then basically, you know, when I got out of jail, Barry lent me, he just fucking gave me like $600,000. He's that kind of guy. He goes, just, dude, here, start again. And I paid him back, of course, right? But he was that sort of guy, right? Well, I mean, Barry, I mean, the stories with Barry, I mean, I'll get back to how he relates to a couple of things I did, but you were just mentioning lending money. I called Barry when I separated from my wife, and I said, I, I didn't even know anything. Like, I was with her for a long time. She handled all my money. I was like, Barry, I'm in trouble. I need some money. Like, I don't know what I do now. I'm like, you know, <laughs> on my own. He's like, what do you need? I'm like, I don't know, two or three. He's like, come over. And I'm he's like, safe, uh, right? he opens his safe. He starts giving me two hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you said you needed two or three. I was thousand. like, I need two, three thousand dollars. I got credit cards. I'm not like destitute. <laughs> but Barry was um, the only thing I said in the room for the entourage pitch because Ari really did sell most of it. But I sold it on a story of Barry, which was when he was living at Trump Tower in 1988 and making all this money. And his upstairs neighbor called him up and said, uh, Barry, you got to start investing your money in something. And he's like, I don't, what do I invest in? He's like, how about art? He's like, I don't know anything about it. And he said, come up to my, uh, uh, you know, my apartment. So he comes, do you know this? He comes, goes up to his apartment. A Colombian billionaire lives in the upstairs apartment. Right. Shows him all this work. He says, what do you like? And Barry, like, looks at this Chagall painting. He's like, I like that one. He's like, I think it was 600 grand in, like, 88. All right. Barry's like, all right, I'll, I'll take it. Goes down to his safe, just like this, gets $600,000 out, takes it, takes the thing off the wall himself, brings it downstairs <laughs> and like hangs it on the wall himself. And then he brings over a bunch of us, which really was like Wolf, was like a bunch of Long Island Goombas who like whatever. And I think he had- Who like the fuck a, is Chagall? You know, as, as I remember, he had like a Lawrence Taylor jersey hanging on the wall and he had the, like one of the first big TV screens, which are like 500 pounds. And we're all sitting there and like Barry is just waiting for someone to notice his Chagall painting on the wall. And these guys wouldn't know it from a whole fucking hole in the wall. So he's like, guys, you see my painting? And everyone's like, yeah, that looks great. He's like, what do you think I paid for that? And uh, 50, everyone's like, yeah, grand, no, grand. I mean, seriously, everyone's like, I don't know. What'd you pay for it? Everyone was more interested in the Lord's Taylor jersey. And it kept going till he's like, I mean, guess, guess. And everyone's like, five grand, 10 grand. He's like, this is one of one. This is the only painting <laughs> on the entire planet. So it finally came back to someone goes, if you paid a dollar over 20 grand, you're a fucking moron. So he calls the guy back up. He's like, listen, I, I can't live with this. I don't know art. I don't want it. And the guy's like, bring it back. Takes it off the wall, brings it back, gives him his money back. Now the now crazy worth, thing. What's it worth now? 30 or 40 million bucks. Right. I, mean, I, got yeah. another, I got another Barry story just yeah. like, so Barry, Barry's like 110 pounds dripping wet. Yeah. But he literally started a fight with a fucking 300 pound fucking karate expert and almost wings. He's that fucking crazy, right? He just. He threatened to kill my trainer <laughs> because he was too sore after a workout. And my trainer is a tough guy. But he called me up. He's like, this guy is crazy. He's threatening to kill me. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> but Barry goes out and he buys a, a Richard Mille watch for like it's almost an identical story. Yeah. He, and he for, for like four hundred grand, yeah. right? And like I, I think I saw him the day he bought the watch. He goes, yeah. check this fucking watch out. It's Richard Mille. And I'm like, oh, it's really nice, Barry. And like and I'm like, wow. He goes, Yeah, check. I look at him like beautiful. He goes, Yeah, it's four hundred fucking grand, right? About five days later, I, I come back and I say, Hey, Oh, where's the watch? That fucking, you know, I wore that fucking watch out. Not one person stopped me and said, that's a nice fucking watch. I, I brought the fucker. Fuck you for selling me this watch. How can you sell me a freaking watch? No one, no one even noticed. He's so funny. I mean, honestly, the, the day he died, I, I had at least, because everybody loved Barry, as crazy as he was. He, so he, even the people that he, he had to love him. Even the people he threatened. So they were all with me the day he died. Like, I had 
a designer I introduced him to or for his house we threatened to kill, <laughs> who, like, they all ended up loving him because right. he was no, that kind of, you know, but the most loyal, generous friend. If you were, like, like, in a bind, this is yeah. the guy that you would call yeah. and wouldn't ask a freaking question. He died. What happened? Just, you don't know. One day he just just dropped dead in his early fifties, yeah. right? Aneurysm, who knows what, yeah. it, whatever it was, yeah. one of those freak. And things. when I was growing up, his his father died when we were very young. His father was the first person I ever knew that died. I was like a little kid, and his father died, I think, at thirty eight, maybe. So um, you know, he he may have had some heart condition or something. But Barry was one of these people. Guys, you, you, you had this guy who was ex it's almost hard to explain this person existed. Like yeah. he was a short seller yeah. by, for a living. That means he'd bet on stocks going down. He's the ultimate naysayer in doubting Thomas. Like, he, his life was based on finding, uncovering fraud on balance sheets. And he would get so fucking emotional yeah. about, like, yeah. with the Chinese company. Yeah, like, he would, like, he would, like get into these long, protracted wars with companies and stuff, you know? Yeah, no, you didn't want to have a grudge with him because no. he would never stop. He, he was would, like the Terminator. He would keep going and going and going. And, uh, you know, I based, so I did a, another pilot for HBO after Entourage called 40 with Michael Imperioli and Eddie Burns and... Um, and I based this character on Barry, and I could not cast him. And it's amazing, like seeing Wolf, because because Jonah, a little, you know, like the funniness of it. And like when I saw, you know, the first time I saw it with you, because I never experienced Quaalude stories through you. I heard him <laughs> from Barry. He's right. older than me, and I, you know, he was one of my running parts. Yeah, Quaaludes. Quaaludes was not a thing I knew about, but I would hear these stories that almost like I didn't believe. And when I saw that scene. It was honestly one of the funniest scenes I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. And I had heard so many times from Barry's these stories about it. So. Barry and I, we would go up in, in his Trump Tower apartment. We would like, it would be like 12 o'clock. And he would take four ludes, I'd take four ludes, and we'd just walk around, like, falling down in the street and shit. And somehow we managed to somehow make it back upstairs yeah. again, like, and live to tell about it. it I, just... mean, I mean, the stories with him, because it's like, even when I was, like, child you know we grew up very middle class neighborhood and barry kind of like goodfellas he started making money like when nobody had any money and he's driving around a convertible mercedes and everybody's like who the fuck is this driving around the town and i went to atlantic city when i was like 16 and you know you take like every dime you have which is like 60 bucks and, and the and worst feels you to, can't get through the toll booth on the way back it's like that miserable you thing. know i get through the toll booth only because i lose whatever it is 150 bucks this is like everything you had i'm gonna kill myself i'm literally like devastated dude i know the and, i know that exact feeling of the toll booth with and, every I, and what happens you know barry's five years older than me so it's a, that's a lot 16 to 21 is a big right. deal so i'm like in the casino and my friends you know i based i did an episode of entourage which was Ari was a little bit of me in Vegas because me when I gamble, which I don't do anymore ever, is like it's not a good mix. So I kind of did me this neither. thing. But anyway, I'm walking through the casino and I'm like going to kill myself. I'm like, I can't eat like for the next two months. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I see Barry. He walks in. He's got two girls on his arm and he's looted out of his mind. And, <laughs> and he looks at me. He's like, Dougie, what's the matter with you? I'm like, I lost everything I have. He's like, he's like, looks at me like genuine concern. He's like, how much did you lose? And I'm like. I don't know, like 120 bucks. He's he's like, are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> he literally hands me ten thousand dollars. He's like, take it. And I'm like, Ugh, are you kidding me? Like I'd never seen that kind of money in my life. And um, you know, that was, that was that was Barry. You know, incredible. I mean, he was one of a kind. In fact, in honor of Barry, this is a perfect time now to take a brief pause here, and I'm going to give everybody here a gift. In honor of Barry, what I'm going to do is, now that you know a little bit about the story of how the straight line was created and just the impact it has on people's lives, I'm going to give everybody here free access to the introduction and the first training module to the formalized straight line certification program. This is a system that I sell for $5,000 here to individuals, to large corporations, medium-sized corporations as well, right? It's a very robust, interactive training with quizzes and exams. It's ultimately a diploma-based course that changes people's lives. But I figure what I'll do, there's like 12 or 13 modules, but I'm going to give everybody, and this is not one of those free things where I say, and you have to enter your credit card, and I hope you don't then forget to cancel. No, no, no. I'm talking, I'm talking really free. I'm going to just simply give you a link and you sign up for it, and you get access to the introduction, then the first training module, which is the five core elements of the straight line, cracking the code for sales and influence. This alone will change your existence. Just understanding what has to go into getting someone to buy from you. 
And again, there's no obligation. You're not putting a credit card in. Um, you have to just enter your information here. And then after you're done, once you've gone through this, if you want to keep going, then we can have a conversation about you picking up with the rest of the train. But this first part of it is free. My gift to you in honor of my old friend Barry, in front of Doug Ellen's friend Barry, who hopefully is resting in peace because he didn't have a lot of peace when he was on this planet. All right? Let me give you the link. The link is jordanbelfort.com. Simple, right? Slash bonus. B-O-N-U-S. So after you're done listening to this podcast, go to jordanbelfort.com slash, that's a forward slash bonus, B-O-N-U-S, and you'll be on a page. You enter your information, and that will give you access to this incredibly robust training you're going to get the introduction and the first module, which includes the quizzes, the exercises. And I promise you that when you're done with this first module, you are going to be blown away. All right? What do you think about, like, the way things are going on now, in, not just, forget the politics of high, what do you think yeah. of the whole thing with just like the, I mean, it's the golden age of TV for sure, right? Yeah. But what do you think in terms of like, you know, if you were going to do Entourage right now, would you do it on like an HBO or would you do it like on a, on a Netflix where all the episodes get released at one time? What do you think about that I, whole difference, I, I right? I think everything's going to be released at one time now. I don't think anybody's going to hold stuff back because people's just too anxious for it. You know, and Entourage was, was a good binge show. I think it was a show people like to watch one after the other. hundred percent. So, so I would have been fine with it, although it feels like a little crazy. You work all this time and then it's like, oh, that's it. It was nice that it was like week after week after week, but I think those days are over, you know? Um, now, when we sold Entourage, HBO was the only game in town. We weren't going anywhere else. There was no, um, obviously, there was no Netflix. There was no this, but there really wasn't any other cable show. So, and it was not a network show. So we kind of made the decision, like either HBO, which at the time was like Sopranos and Sex in the City. So this was the the biggest thing in the world if you could get in there. So that's the only place we wanted to. What go. do you think, in terms of like, I mean. You bring a point in the attention span. Everyone wants everything right now. But, like, when we were kids, right? I'm a little bit older than you, but not much. Um, it was, like, the Saturday night movie of the week or something. And you'd, if you saw something in the theater, you had to wait, like, two yeah. years. Remember, like, that whole it's thing? Yeah. And it was a big deal when it came on. Like, yep. do you think the world is better off or not, for like, the way things are today? Like, what do you think about that? I mean, like I said, I like the nostalgia of waiting for something. I mean, I, I wouldn't do it. Obviously, if it was available to me, I'm going to watch it. But I remember those days where you couldn't wait. Even Sopranos, where you'd run home and you couldn't right. wait to see what happens. It's sad that those things are never going to happen again. And, um, you know, even, like, it's interesting with Entourage. I used to be at restaurants and I'd hear people talking about it, you know, like on Monday morning. So... Those days, I think, are gone, but I think the upside is is that there's so many more opportunities for people who have talent to get their voices heard and to be seen because there's so many avenues available to them, you know? What do you think the future is for, um, for, for like, these shows? you think it's all on the streaming and instant release? I mean, HBO still does. I think they're doing, like, they release maybe one or they, they do a couple to start. How are they doing it? I'm not sure how they're doing it. I think everybody will be like all at once soon. If not now, I think that's the way it's going to be, you know? I'd be surprised if anyone's able to hold it back like that, you know? Like, I'm thinking of what's the last show, which is Game of Thrones, really, where I feel people were, like, running home to see something live. I just don't think that's going to happen anymore. I think sporting events are the last, you know, kind of live-action things that you're going to see. So, wow. Yeah, I could and, be wrong, though. And as a writer, would you write a show differently that's being released? Is there a difference in how you structure and write a show? I mean, again, you know what I'm saying? Like, like yeah. I mean, like, if there's a weak gap, it's almost like you have to almost reintroduce what what happened. Oh no, it doesn't. I mean, I don't, I don't think like that. So I, I don't I don't know that anyone does, but I think, you know, like I said, I always try to make things as quick and w leave people wanting more as much as possible, so that they do come back for the next one. But I think that's the key for every show. You want to leave a hook. You want people to be excited and. Uh, you know, I don't know if you watch like like this you show. If you watch the show, you know, it's like everyone yeah. I know is talking about this. Yeah, the guy like, is a maniac yeah, guy. Yeah, it yeah, just yeah. like hooks you. I've like it. every episode ends and you're like, all right, I can't wait to see what happens next. And that's the best way when you can see it. So nothing's worse though than the old the dum LA law. The yeah. the uh, the, uh, the uh, law and order thing. Right, right. It's like yeah. you hit like, oh I'm screwed for another hour, yeah, I gotta yeah. keep watching it, right? Yep. So what is so now you're working on a bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. right? Yep. What do you think is next for you? I mean, like you know, where's your career? You have said so much success, right? But I mean, yeah. I, I think for you is 
is it the next big TV series? Is that like, I mean, is I'd that like, the dream for you? I, yeah, you know, I don't know that my dreams are as strong as they used to be. You know, it is, the truth is it is a grind. Um, but I'd like to do another half hour show. You know, I was, I was lucky in, with HBO because I was, network shows were doing 22 to 30 episodes, which I'm like, I, I'll die doing that. And, and was, why is that, by the way? What's, why is that with this? With, uh, there's a huge difference, right? There's yeah. network, they're like, it's like a really long, yeah. why is that? Well, I mean, I think it's changing a little bit now with network, and, and I don't watch very much network stuff, but, you know, they used to want to get to the 100 episodes and syndication, and that was the big money, which for the most part I think has kind of vanished now. I think it's very hard to, you know, it used to be if you made a sitcom for a half an hour and it made 100 episodes, you made, you know, a few hundred million dollars. I think those days are over, but... Um, the idea of making eight or ten a year is, you know, nice to me. I think that's a good way to do it. And, you know, the way we did Entourage and now the way a lot of these shows do, which wasn't really back then, is we shot them like little movies. So they were big productions. And they were big, you know, movements all over the place and stuff. So, um, but that's what I'd like to do. Nice half-hour comedy, ten a year and whatever. So we'll see. So I got a couple I'm working on right now. Half hour versus an hour? Yeah, for me. It's less pages, less writing, you know. Uh, the hour, hour tends to be more story-driven. I mean, um, half hour hopefully more comedy-driven and, and more character-driven. But, you know, there's so much good stuff on right now that it's hard to lock anything into anything. What do, what do you think about, you know, and I know you have to be guarded in your answer here, but like in terms of the whole, like you know, the whole Me Too thing, right? Yeah. It's sort of like the 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 the, the gorilla in every room here in terms of I guess, is it died down at all the insanity? Or is it still going? Is I mean, I think it's died down a little bit, and there's a little bit. Uh, I think there's always an overcorrection in things, you know. It's just like in the market, there's an overcorrection, and then it starts to bounce back. But you know, I think that. Um, Something needed to be said and something needed to be done, but then I think it took it to a level of, you know, unbelievableness, you know. And like right now, I just I just heard yesterday they're doing Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross with with females. It's like everything now is like let's see how we can do something with female. And you talk about one of the most men centric, you know, plays ever written, and then they're gonna do it with females, which maybe it'll be great, but it seems strange. No, I'm to sure me. it'll suck. But you know, I think that it'll suck. The it'll suck. I just think it's an overcorrection, but something obviously need to be said and people right. need to be wary of that in the workplace and you know do you think that right now it, it who's got the advantage in hollywood right now like it used to be i remember there was this age back in the 90s it was like the age of the, the super agent where all of a sudden like the agents for the power center yeah. Yeah. right then yeah and like we had the uh, this ovids came on yeah. and the see and then it's kind of shifted away from where's yeah. the real power now in hollywood well, I mean, obviously you know there's so much money with Netflix and Amazon. I mean, they have unlimited resources, but I think still they need good content. So the people who can create good content to me are always the people who are in the best position. Um, but, you know, the, the amount of money they have and the fact that they don't care if they lose it, you know, because there's just so many subscribers coming to them. They can spend $100 million on a TV show. I mean, that was, you know beyond unheard of so um and put a movie out they put the irishman on on netflix i mean i know it was in the theater for a few weeks but it's crazy to me you know to think that like what did it gross in the theaters like five million dollars i mean that would have like that would have shut down a studio 10 years ago you know right. and now it's like oh it's great we added however many subscribers so it's it's a weird time i have no idea what's gonna happen um you know the thing i say is like how many how many services can people really subscribe to. I mean, all day on my phone, I get $5.99 for Disney, $9.99 for Amazon, Me and this, too. that. So um, I'm not sure how it's going to last. I guess what I'm saying is, I, I think one of the values, I, mean, I think I, well, that's, I think you're in a really good position to like to advise people. Like, There's so many people that want to come to Hollywood, mm -hmm. whether to be directors, actresses, yeah. actors, or they call them actresses are really actors now, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. They want to be called actresses, right? Everyone's, Act, an, actor. everyone's an actor, right? Yeah, everyone's Directors, man. filmmakers, you know, writers, yeah. which you are, right? Though you did start, I saw you in some episodes in Entourage where yeah. you were hysterical. And, and nobody cares. Always torturing, <laughs> always torturing drama. In the yeah, <laughs> I thought I could make it easier as an actor, but nobody, yeah. nobody cared. Nobody noticed me except you. Do you think it's a great time right now for all the young people of the world in their 20s and 30s, even the teens that want to be in this business, oh, yeah. is, it the, is, it the the is, it, is it like the golden yeah. age right now? It's, it's the best time. I mean, you know, um, I made my first short film. It cost me every dollar I could scrape together. I could do it today on an iPhone, the same thing. It would look just as good for $300, you know? I was in my apartment with film strips everywhere, trying to hire editors and do this. Everything that you could do on iMovie now. So, 
you know, you see on Instagram, all you got to do is, you know, or TikTok, all you got to do is go make a movie now. And if you have some talent, you have a good shot of getting seen. So I think it is the by far the best time for people with creativity um, and they can just go do it. So, so whether you're like, you know, for actor, director, doesn't matter. It's just, is there just a thirst right now for, for me? Like, what would you, like if you were young, like if you were a kid, like in the Midwest mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, you yeah. aspire to be famous as an actor. You yeah. say now's the time to come to Hollywood, Great, best time yeah. ever, you think? Yeah, and I don't, I mean, as I said, you don't even have to come to Hollywood. You can start making your own stuff in your house and you start posting it on Instagram and um, you see the amount of things that go viral that are good. I mean, when you start to have, and a lot of stuff that's bad also, as we know, but um, I think there is an opportunity now to be heard that did not exist 10 years ago and it's gonna be interesting to see where it goes, but the amount of people getting discovered overnight now is is wild, so. All right, some rapid fire questions. Ready? Yeah. Favorite movie of all time? Yeah, I got to rapid fire that. I mean, I I, I have this top like, one, of top two or three. Which favorite movies for you? <laughs> Goodfellas, Casino. I mean, then then I go to comedies, but uh, I don't know, Airplane. Um, I don't know. I got a lot of comedies and dramas, but it's anything. Came, Goodfellas came right out for you. I you know it's like Goodfellas, Raging Bull, Casino is like you know, and Wolf too. Honestly, there's about an hour of Wolf I could watch every single day of my life, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, the movies that come on cable that you watch every single time they come on are like the ones I consider my favorite. Favorite TV series of all time outside of Entourage. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not my favorite. But uh, yeah, favorite TV, Sopranos, Cheers, um, All in the Family, Mad Men. What do you think of the comment about, about that Scorsese and Coppola about the whole superhero it's thing? It's ridiculous. I mean, that's ridiculous. And again, like, they're two of my favorite filmmakers, but the stuff that these people are doing with, with some of these superhero movies is incredible. And it's art, and it's, you know, uh, cinematography, production design, writing, acting. So, I, I mean, I, I just I think was shocked at that, by I just the way. Think I agree with you. I think it's stupid. Best up-and-coming actor in Hollywood right now. You know, I, I said that I'm blanking on his name. I love that kid from... Uh, Drive was that the movie? Drive? Yeah, oh, it's ba Baby Driver. You mean Baby Driver? Yeah. Yeah. What's I, I hear about him again? So that's the, say, yeah. the second person yeah. that said he's an up and coming star. Yeah. I mean, he's already a star, I guess. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. But, but so, crazy enough, sec I'm no, the second as person as well. in two days that he, said he's, he's a special. He's unbelievable. You just watch him. And what's just, his name? That guy from Baby Driver. Someone mentioned this. <laughs> I guess he's up and coming at this point, but he's he's a star already. But I don't know. I'm blanking on his name. <laughs> you know. You know. One thing I see with all TV series, not just Entourage, yeah. it's like. Eventually, the characters almost become cliches of themselves yeah. over the time. Did you try to? Did you, did you notice that and try to fight against that? Like, you know, you what try I mean? to a little bit, but you also try to play into it. I mean, it's like you know, like I said, Cheers is one of my favorite shows. Norm, twenty seasons in, was walking into the bar and people were going Norm, and a lot of people, a lot of people like that familiarity. A lot of people like that they're friends, and you know, the best thing, you know, for me for Entourage because what I that was really modeled on on with Mark's inspiration, my friends and how I grew up, and so many of my friends became characters on the show but um when people would come up to me and say like lebron james we went to dinner with lebron james he goes this is my e this is my drama and this is my turtle and that's what i was going for you right. know so oh for sure um, yeah, yeah so yeah. you know whatever it was like you know criticism hate I don't, I don't i don't really give a shit you know like i felt good about the show and i felt like we did what we wanted to do and at the end of the day really what it was supposed to be was about friendship and loyalty and taking these fish out of water guys like we grew up and putting him in this fantasy world of Hollywood and that's, you know, that's what we did, so. I can't tell you how many times Vince would do something and I'd say, I did exactly what I would do. Yeah, I mean. Like buying cars for his friends, doing the, you know, just... And Vince had a lot of, a lot of Barry in him. Yeah, you know? like, about, like you said, Connolly, I mean, Connolly, we go to Barry's house, he's never met Barry in his life and Connolly like sees his Bentley sitting in the driveway. Him, here you go. And Connolly goes, would I look like a jerk off in a Bentley? And Barry goes, I don't know, take it, see how you feel. And he's like, what do you mean? I mean, they never met so kevin left with with barry's bentley and had it for three months you know he ultimately <laughs> decided he, he didn't want to drive a bentley but uh barry's like just take it and barry used to do that all shit all the time and those were stuff that inspired me because barry and again unfortunately he stole some of his shit <laughs> whatever but as a friend he was most loyal generous human being yeah. you know of any anybody i was ever he friends really was with, so. yeah so you know we're making the wolf of wall street into a tv series mm -hmm. yep with terry winter yeah Man. What do you think of Terry? I mean, what I said is, you gave me the book. <laughs> I mean, again, I'm not saying I would have ever made this movie like Marty and Terry did. You gave me the book way before. And I was like, Jordan, you're a fucking asshole. People are going to hate your guts. <laughs> and whether it was Terry, Marty, Leo discovered that this was the comedy 
that it became. I mean, I love Terry, by the way. I try to get him to do a show idea that I had. I think he's a genius. But I'm always like, who came up with that this is a comedy? Like, who thought that this is going to be one of the funniest movies of all time? You well, know? I wrote it to be, when I wrote the book, it was intended yeah. to be that way. It was this black comedy. And yeah. like, when I first met Terry, he just, like, we met and he yeah. just got that. Like, he was like, he's like, Dude, this is just, he saw it. And, and, like, and I think what amazed me about Terry is his lack of ego. Yeah. Like he had no, he goes, dude, I love the way you write. I'm going to take your book. I'm not going to rewrite it. I'm going to formulate, he like ripped my book apart and put it into this movie. I was just so shocked because it's really hard, to, yeah. which I can't so do with you guys. I wrote yeah. books. I can't do what you do. What's it's it? very difficult to make every word. You have so few words. I tried to write a script once and I was like on page five and like as I, I was still on like nothing the first happened. nothing yeah, happened yeah. right I was like what the fuck wait it, like, how could it be only 100 pages it'll be 700 pages my script it's a skill and Terry's as good as anybody Marty too obviously because he writes and I don't know who wrote which Terry this, Terry wrote but, so what happened was I wrote the book yeah. Terry adopted it and literally the first draft he wrote was fucking the movie yeah. It was so close. That was polished yeah. many times. I polished a lot of the boardroom lingo and the sales scenes like that. But he wrote the well, fring. For me, that's it's so amazing to me because you know, growing up with Barry and knowing these stories, which I used to laugh at. I just when reading the book, I'm like, <laughs> people are gonna hate everything about these people. And then I see the movie, and I'm like, oh my god, this is like a fucking brilliant comedy. I'm such a moron, you know. And again, not that I was getting the movie, but. You know, uh, well, hopefully you can work on the TV series yeah, at least some episodes with Terry because we do. Terry's, you know, he's going to start amazing. soon. Terry's yeah. amazing though. So he's the best. Yeah. So what's next for you? you, you anything you want to talk about? Uh, no, nothing specific. I'm going out with a pitch in the next month of a show I want to do, and uh, we'll see. You know, you take it to market, see what people think of it, and go from there. Your personal yeah. life. So you got divorced. You have the awesome. I have a great girlfriend right there. You know, yep, Sarah Sanderson, comic. She's great, right? Yeah, she's great. Great. There's nothing better. When I, when I met you and I met, met you, your girlfriend for a while, I was like, you're one lucky dude. You have got, you know, when you get the right woman in your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. The wrong woman is just like such a disaster. Yes, and because I've, I've never seen, had some no, I know, because I've never seen you this as happy and no. content as I've seen. Yeah, you know, right. but then I've known you for a while, but you seem like really just like you're on top now because you got the right person Everything in your life. Feels good. Everything feels good. So awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, one thing you have to promise me you at least at least work a little bit on the Wolf TV series. I would, I would love to I, you know, I, you know, because you know it's Terry's yeah. project, but I know he loves you, and I yeah. just think you'd be awesome too. So, great. all right, guys, listen, Doug Ellen, the man, the myth, the legend. Thank you for coming <laughs> Thanks, on. You're the best. For me. Appreciate it. All right, take all right. care, buddy. Yep. Bye bye.